Hello, my name is Aiden Koval, and this segment you're about to watch is in honor of Black History Month, where I'm going to be discussing the serious topic of environmental racism. If you don't know about this issue and you want to know more, please tune in. Environmental racism is a major form of systemic racism, especially in the United States of America. Communities of color are disproportionately burdened by health hazards through the policies and practices of local, state, and federal government. These policies force minority communities to live near health hazards such as sewage plants, toxic waste facilities, garbage incinerators and landfills, power plants, major roadway systems, and especially emitters of airborne particulate matter. These health hazards can vary from workplaces with poor health regulations to coal-fired power plants in the proximity of non-white communities. From citizens drinking contaminated groundwater to children going to school and buildings rotting with asbestos problems. In the next few clips, you'll see an interview with Mr. Bromley where he'll explain the roots of environmental racism and how that worldview is still prevalent in our society today. The United States in our country, in the name of westward expansion and economic growth, has done so by displacing um, people and murdering people. Our country and much of the Western developed world is the product of um, a colonial of colonialism, right? That has been driven by predominantly white European people interested in expanding their power, interested in expanding wealth. And as that has happened, um, there there have been impacts, and this is what we study in environmental science. Then is that that economic expansion and engine that is has been created and continues to be driven is at the at the expense of natural resources so then the impacts on climate water desertification deforestation right these are all big impacts that are being largely driven by capitalistic economic forces that have their history i would argue in the desire for colonial rule for the expansion of power. You ask, is it only black people who are affected? And, and I think it is important to, um, in our vocabulary, in our way of talking about environmental racism, is to acknowledge the fact, in, you know, in, in the United States in particular, that so that Native Americans, and this has become increasingly troubling for me, you know, the way that Native Americans have been treated by the U.S. government, our relationship with with people who were here before us, right? We came here, sought to colonize the United States, and right away, that has, that, that's, that was the beginning of the end for Native American um, community, many Native American communities um, as we know it, it's more like an onion. There's multiple layers to this, uh, to to this, and in, so colonialism, capitalism, consumption of natural resources, displacing people, abusing people. It's all one part of the same onion. We don't need the same old old white voices saying the same thing. We need new voices, people who have not been heard in the past um, being elevated and brought forth and being honored um, to, to find a new way forward. Because I have been the beneficiary of economic and political systems, right, because of the color of my skin, it is difficult for me to find solutions that don't have underpinnings that just continue uh, the, the, the same old, same old. Listening purposely to people of color, indigenous people, Native Americans, and learning from their traditions is, is super important to address in a really authentic way um, the environmental racism that exists um, in our country and throughout the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Bromley. I appreciate you explaining how environmental racism dates all the way back to the beginning of our nation's history. In these next few clips, you'll see a TED Talk by David Lammy,
where he'll explain how the climate action movement and the Black Lives Matter movement are deeply connected and how you can't just have one without the other. And let me say something about how we build this new movement and what it must look like. First, we need a recognition that the climate movement is not only about protecting the planet, it is primarily about caring for the people who live on the planet. Globally, as well as nationally, we need to recognize structural imbalances and inequalities. A radical green recovery plan should provide jobs to the people who've been disenfranchised for centuries. We cannot tackle the climate crisis without addressing racial inequalities. And we cannot solve racial inequalities without fixing the economic system. The new deal the economy needs is not only green, it's green and black. Black people breathe in the most toxic air relative to the general population. We are more likely to suffer from respiratory diseases like asthma. And it is people of color who are more likely to suffer in the climate crisis. This is no coincidence. Black Americans are exposed to 56% more pollution than they cause. White Americans breathe 17% less air pollution than they produce. It gives a whole new meaning to the Black Lives Matter slogan, I can't breathe. These statistics that David Lamy just explained may be somewhat confusing to people hearing them for the first time. Let me just explain them a little further. What he just said is that black Americans breathe in 56% more pollution than they produce, whereas white Americans, they're breathing in 17% less pollution than they produce. That is a very important stat that I'm sure not many people have heard of before, even myself. Many of you know the young climate activist Greta Thunberg, and in the next segment, David Lamy explains how a photo of her pictured with three other white climate activists is actually cropped. Second. We need more black leaders. It cannot be right in 2020 that almost all the leading climate change activists we recognize are white. At Davos this year, five young female members of the Fridays for Future movement came together to give a press conference at the World Economic Forum. This is a picture the Associated Press put out. Here, is the original image. As the Ugandan activist, Vanessa Nakate herself put it afterwards, you didn't just erase a photo, you erased a continent. We need to look at who is being cropped out of leadership positions in environmental organizations too. And finally, racial injustice and climate injustice are both rooted in the evil notion that some lives are more important than others. Economics, race, and class are at the center of today's political struggles. The Black Lives Matter movement needs to wake up to climate injustices, just as the climate movement must make every effort to include the reality of people of color. David Lamy makes incredible points here, stating that the climate justice movement really cannot happen without the protection of black lives and people of color. In this next segment, you'll see Bavana where she'll explain how the Warren County protest triggered this movement. So a small place in the county of North Carolina called Warren, which is a poor and mostly black community, was targeted for the location of a hazardous waste facility. And this facility would accept PCB contaminated soil from illegal dumpings of toxic waste along roadways. But the people in this county stood up and created a massive protest in which 500 people were arrested. And this protest was known nationally. And even though it did fail to prevent the dump site, it triggered like a massive movement among all the people who felt the same and were experiencing the same thing. These people felt a lack of power to make decisions on where to locate facilities, as well as that they felt that they were being targeted based on their race and economic status. This was just the beginning of the environmental movement. Environmental racism still exists today. And for how environmental justice is taking place today, a place called Valero is planning on implementing a pipeline that would run through Memphis, Tennessee. However, this past December, about 60 protesters and activists stood against the pipeline. And this black community has been the dumping site of Memphis for many years. For example, the city installed a, ma a massive sewage waste treatment facility next to their community alongside other toxic release facilities. These include an iron mill, a chemical plant, um, a steel mill, an oil refinery, and the defunct Tennessee Valley fossil plant, which left behind a pond of toxic coal ash. Boxton has been described as being the path of least resistance and its residents are no longer accepting that. 
The only reason that Valero has been building this pipeline is to cut costs to the company and the company has refused to conduct any sort of any type of environmental assessment um, impact or produce any sort of safety plan and the residents of Boxdown, Fraser and other historically black communities recognize, this, recognize that this pipeline is extremely dangerous but are being put down by powerful companies and others who support this project. Scientific studies have connected living in, near an oil refinery with an increased risk to bladder, lung, colon, and prostate and breast cancers. The company plans to lay the dangerous plan uh, just four feet underground, which is an incredibly reckless plan. Thank you so much, Pavana. As she said, the Warren County protest triggered a huge movement in which hundreds of thousands of people stood up for what they believed in. With the Bihalia pipeline and people still protesting this today, it's very evident that this movement is still very well alive. With it being Black History Month, I'd like to take the time to honor the father of environmental racism, whose name is Robert Bullard. Robert Bullard was the author of 18 award-winning books, all concerning topics of sustainable development, environmental racism, housing, climate change, transportation, and regional equity. In 1979, Robert Bullard was called on as an expert witness in a case against a waste management team attempting to put a landfill next to an 82% Black middle-class community. With this role, he conducted a study that documented the location of municipal waste disposal facilities throughout Houston. The study was titled Solid Waste Sites in the Black Community and was the first account of eco-racism in the United States. What the study found was that five city-owned landfills, six out of eight city-owned garbage incinerators, and three out of four privately owned landfills were all located in black neighborhoods. This is while Houston's black population was just 25%. The findings of the study prompted Robert Bullard's long career in fighting environmental racism. And here's a quote about what he had to say about the study. Without a doubt, it was a form of apartheid where whites were making decisions and black people and brown people and people of color, including Native Americans on reservations, had no seat at the table. Thank you for making it to the end of the segment. Environmental racism is a very serious issue that needs to be talked about more. If we wanna fight against climate change and take action to save our planet, we need to be willing and able to fight for equality as well. People of color are disproportionately burdened by health hazards and I have no opportunity to make decisions due to policies and regulations by the government. If as a country and as the world we would like to change, we need to move past the worldview of believing that natural resources are never ending. We need to stop thinking that we must maximize off the land and move past that. If we wanna fight climate change and fight for equality, we need to change. Thank you.